I want to spin the laptop here and say. Yeah, we're ready whenever you are. If you're watching online, we apologize for being a little bit late. We were having some technical difficulties, but we're ready to start our class on continuing our New Testament survey class. We'll begin today in the book of Hebrews. Hello, Mama. Uh, and we will start. That's on page not five of your handout, of lesson number nine. And as we start that, let's go to God in prayer. Father, we are so thankful for all that you do for us. Thank you for, for today and for the blessings you've given us for this beautiful weather. God, we thank you for this class, and we just ask that your spirit be with us today as we go through these various books that we'll cover this afternoon. Uh, guide our discussion, guide us, so we can learn those things you want us to know. Father, we give you all the praise, especially as for Evelyn today, that you'd be with her and help her as she's having some difficulty. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are in, we're going to start the book of Hebrews. If you remember, we ended 2 Timothy. Deb, can you see something there? Okay. We ended 2 Timothy last week. That was the last of Paul's letters. We're now moving into what we are generally referred to as the general epistles. And we'll do Hebrews first. Why is Hebrews the first book after Paul's letters? Anybody remember? How are the books placed in the Bible? Isn't it longest to shortest? Absolutely. Longest to shortest. And so if you've ever paid any attention to your Bible, you'll notice that after the book of Acts, we get all of Paul's letters. And we start with Romans, but not because it was first, but because it was the longest. And then they, they go down. If you ever look through those, you look back through your handouts. Of course, we're doing this study chronologically as opposed to uh, through the way they're in the Bible. So we don't always measure up to that. But if you look at your Bible, you'll notice that with Romans, 1 and 2 Corinthians, and then the letters get shorter and shorter and shorter as the time goes by. As we... Uh, now get into the general epistles, after all of Paul's letters are done, the same application applies except for the book of Revelation. Revelation is in a category all by itself, so we'll touch on that when we get to that one. But all the other books are the same way. Hebrews is the longest non-Paul book, and so we'll pick up with that one and go all the way through as you look at your Bible index. Uh, Hebrews, as we're saying, it's 13 chapters, so it's a pretty long book. Uh, as far as Bible books go, and remember when we started this study, this was a letter, so it would have been somebody's handwritten uh, quill and ink letter, uh, which is a pretty long, pretty long letter. 303 verses, 4,953 Greek words as we get into this book. The author is an interesting thing, and nobody really knows for sure who the author is. Uh, the early church pretty much agreed it was uncertain. It was anonymous in the sense that they didn't know who it was. Uh, the Eastern Church, meaning predominantly the Roman Catholic Church, I'm sorry, the, strike that, go the other way, the Greek Orthodox Church, uh, believed it was Paul. And as far as they were concerned, they said Paul's the guy who wrote this letter. The Western Church, which is the Roman Catholic Church, uh, they pretty well concluded it was not Paul. Why do we have an Eastern and a Western Church? Why do, we, why do we talk about that? Anybody know? We talk about it primarily because the Roman Catholic Church divided. And it was controlled by Rome. It was the western side, Constantinople, and that farther to the east was the Eastern Church. The Eastern Church becomes the Greek Orthodox Church of today, predominantly. But for the longest time, it was a Roman Catholic Church a spinoff, and there was a constant battle between Rome on one hand and the Eastern churches on the other, and they were always fighting. If you remember when we studied some of this, in 1054, there was an official split because of a couple of ideas that they differed on, and so the Pope in Rome said, fine, we're going to excommunicate you because you don't agree with us, and so the church in the East, it's Constantinople, said, well, we'll one-up you, we'll excommunicate you because you don't agree with us, and so the split's been there ever since. Uh, Rome gets destroyed by Asian and European armies, ultimately. The uh, Greek Orthodox Church, in the eastern part of the empire, survives much longer than the Roman area does until the Muslims come, and then the Muslims conquer uh, the eastern part of the church. 
But the Roman Catholic Church says not Paul. The Eastern Church says it probably was Paul. Here's a passage that, in reading it, can raise some questions. It's chapter 1, verse 20. Uh, strike that. Chapter 13, verse 20. It says, Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equipped you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I urge you to bear with my word of exhortation, for in fact I have written to you quite briefly. I'm thinking that's a strange way to say that in the 13th chapter letter. It says, I want you to know that our brother Timothy has been released. If he arrives soon, I'll come with him to see you. Greet all your leaders and all the Lord's people. Those from Italy send their greetings. Grace be with you all. Who does that sound like? Paul. Oh, it. I mean, Timothy's in a lot of Paul's letters. He's in, with him in a lot of the letters that he's writing. Here, this guy, whoever's writing this, and refers to Timothy, our brother, who's going to be released. Now, Paul, Timothy's not in jail, but Paul's in jail. So if Timothy, if this is the same Timothy... Now, he apparently has been incarcerated somewhere along the way. But yeah, you read this and you think, well, that sort of sounds like Paul. Yeah. Uh, some people think it might have been Luke. Remember Luke's with Paul? Luke's mentioned by Paul several times. He travels with him, writes a couple of books himself. Some so they think, well, maybe it was Luke. He and Timothy have built some kind of a bond. And they're working together. It's a high Greek style. Uh, the way the Greek language in Hebrew is much more formal than some of the other letters like John's letters that we get. Martin Luther, who doesn't come along for another 1,500 years, really thought, thought maybe Apollos wrote it. And again, he doesn't have any real authority to say that, except he looks at Acts chapter 18, and he says, Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he only knew the baptism of John. He learns the baptism of Jesus Christ. But some people suggest, or Martin Luther suggests, maybe Apollos is this guy who is learning the scripture, knows all this stuff, and so he's the guy that maybe uh, wrote it. The truth of the matter is, Origen, who's an early church father, says it best when he says God only knows. Nobody really knows who wrote the book of Hebrews. But the early church has well accepted that it was a letter in the book of First Clement, which is not a part of the canon, not part of the Bible. But Clement was an early church father, wrote a lot of letters, a lot of things. Many of them have been preserved. He's writing about 95 AD. He refers to the book of Hebrews. So it's a book the early church knew about. It didn't show up in a, in a void. Uh, a lot of early church fathers reference it. There's a present tense reference to the temple in Jerusalem. A lot of people read that and suggest, well, if that's the case, it had to have been written before 70 AD because that's when the temple was destroyed. And so most of the scholars suggest probably written somewhere around AD 65. So some 30 years or so after Jesus. Questions about any of that? Again, there's nobody in the letter saying who it is. Paul always writes. You know, here I am, Paul, so-and-so writing to you, not in the book of Hebrews, which sort of discounts <coughs> Paul being the person that wrote it. It doesn't meet his style. Uh, that's why most people suggest it probably wasn't Paul. Do people think it's, it could be Barnabas? Yes, we've looked at that somewhere along the way. Some people suggested Barnabas, although in the study for the class, I really couldn't find a whole lot of well-known people who suggested that, but that was one option maybe Barnabas wrote it. The recipients of the book, the Jewish background professing Christians. And if you remember going through Paul's letters, Paul was always struggling with the Jews, right? They were coming along behind him. They were teaching new Christians. Well, it's okay to be a Christian, but if you're going to be a good Christian, you also got to be a good Jew. You got to do all the law of Moses stuff. You got to do the things we've always done in our life. And since we've been the children of God all this time, you need to just do what we want to do. Paul battled that all the time. The Jewish people trying to impose more rules on Christians than God imposed upon them. But the people receiving this letter clearly are Jewish background, and we'll touch on some of that as we get into the book. 
like in all congregations, there are some real Christians in whoever the recipients are, and there's some Christians in name only. Christians who have said they're children of God, Christians who have uh, professed faith in Jesus Christ, but clearly the way they're living uh, doesn't show that they really are Christians after all. They've been persecuted. They've been, they're being pressured to revert to Judaism. And you can imagine that with the tradition and history of the Jewish people coming out of that way of life and doing something different, a lot of pressure on those early Christians who were Jewish, all the early ones were primarily, uh, they were being pressured to come back to Judaism. Do it the way we've always done it. Uh, stop doing it like this. Uh, and so the book of Hebrews addresses that issue and covers a whole lot of stuff on what it's like to be Jewish. The primary purpose of the book of Hebrews is to write to Christian people and tell them don't defect. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't walk away. Uh, don't go back to doing things that you're not supposed to be doing. Uh, it's a long, long road. Uh, you need not to leave. You need to leave behind the Old Testament ceremonies. Early Jewish people were still going to the temple, still doing sacrifices, still doing the Law of Moses stuff. A part of the book of Hebrews primarily says... Not only don't defect, don't leave Christianity and go back to doing stuff that you've been doing before, but primarily you need to get out of this Old Testament ceremony stuff. You need to stop focusing on what the Old Testament law of Moses was and move on into to Christianity where well, we don't have to worry about that kind of stuff. A guy by the name of Walter Martin, who does a lot of writing on the book of Hebrews, said it like this, it's sort of a tongue twister. He says, the book of Hebrews was written by a Hebrew to other Hebrews, telling the Hebrews to stop acting like Hebrews. <laughs> I know there's just some Jewish guy who's writing this book to Jewish Christians to tell them, you've got to stop acting Jewish. You need to act Christ-like. You need to stop letting the old law uh, control who you are. Simple outline of the book. Uh, it really starts out the first few chapters. Christ is better than the angels than Moses, than the conquest, than the priesthood, than the old covenant, than the temple, than all the sacrifices. And then it concludes with, because of that, because he is so much better than all of these other things, don't defect. Endure. Hang on. Don't quit doing the stuff God wants you to do. Question about any of that before we get to my favorite verses? Y'all got any favorite verses? Okay, Deb? Hebrews 11 and 1. Read that for us. <laughs> the whole chapter one. Now seven. faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. You know, people frequently ask, what is faith? You know, how does it work? What are we supposed to do with it? The Hebrew writing gives us a great definition of what faith is. And again, depending upon what translation you're reading, it's either the assurance, my translation says, <laughs> it is the confidence mm -hmm. that what we hope for will actually happen. And we've touched on when we did hope last week, or two weeks ago, I guess, uh, for our Advent stuff. Hope, the Christian hope isn't just, well, I hope I win the lottery. You know, I hope, whatever it is, I hope we have pecan pie for Christmas. You know, this idea of uh, hope that says, you know, sort of a pie in the sky dream, that isn't the Christian hope. Christian hope is an assurance that what the Bible tells us is coming, is coming. That's the kind of faith we're supposed to have. It isn't the kind of faith that says, well, I hope God's real. Well, I hope I get to go to heaven. Faith is the assurance that those things we hope for are real. They're actually going to happen. It goes on to say, in my translation, it gives us assurance about things we can't see. So don't have the kind of faith that says, you know, I'm going to flip a coin, and if it comes out, it comes up heads. The faith Christians have is not a wishy-washy pie in the sky dream. It's a faith that says, I know who my Redeemer is. I know the promises he's made for me. I have no doubt that what the Bible says is true. What else? Anybody? Any others? Let me give you some of mine again. Chapter 1, verse 1. Starts the book out. I love this one. It tells us who we should be listening to now. It says, In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, 
whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom also he made the universe. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. The Hebrew writer says, you know, we used to have all this stuff. God spoke into people in all kinds of ways. But now in these last days, he spoke to us through Jesus. And then he picks up, because he starts this way, he then covers, uses several chapters to say why Jesus is the one we should be listening to. Here, is, he's not only spoken to him, but he's the guy we need to listen to and put aside all that other stuff because it's not there anymore. What are the last days? Two options, maybe. One is he's just saying just his last 30 years. You know, the, the recent times, we might say. But others suggest the last days, meaning the last days of the Jewish nation. They get destroyed in 70 AD. Rome comes back at about 130 AD because others come along after 70 AD. They don't totally destroy the Jewish people. There's enough of them left where they're still creating problems. So about 130 AD, they come and basically destroy anything that's left. So a lot of people, when you read through the New Testament, and you read about the last days, these end times. He isn't talking about the end times coming whenever Jesus comes back. They're talking about the end time of the Jewish dispensation. God was about to change the way he dealt with people. Prior to this time, the Jews were God's chosen people. You could cross a light in. A few Gentiles did. But in reality, it was the Jews who were God's people. After Jesus comes, the Jews are no longer God's chosen people. God's chosen people now are the church. So a lot of times in the New Testament, when you read about last days, end times, that kind of stuff, they're talking about that generation's end time. It's going to end the way life's been uh, all the, up until now. I like this verse because I love it. Verse, chapter 1, verse 14, Are not all angels, ministering spirits, sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? The Bible says angels are sent to this earth to take care of us. I suspect angels have helped us from time to time. And if you look back over your life and there's been a situation or something where you thought, did you look back at it, how did I ever survive that? How did I ever get through this? That's a very good chance an angel showed up and got you through it. I believe this verse out of I believe God sends his angels to Christian people from time to time to do things for us because we are the ones who are inheriting salvation. Chapter 2, verse 14, Since the children, that's us, have flesh and blood, he too, meaning Jesus, this is going on to pick up the idea of why should we listen to Jesus now? Why is he better than all this other stuff? He too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. The Hebrew writer says Jesus Christ took on flesh Christmas time at the Christmas story. You ever heard this passage read at Christmas time? Probably not. But this is the Christmas story. Jesus Christ shared in our humanity. He came to this earth as a human. He took on flesh and blood because we have flesh and blood. And so Jesus came to do that so that he could break Satan's power and we don't have to be afraid of death. We don't have to be afraid of dying. That's what Jesus came to do. Chapter 3 he says, See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you have a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the end. If you remember Paul's letters, many of his letters were, here's what the problems are, now you people need to get it right, you need to live right, you need to stop doing this. Hebrew writer does the same thing. Remember that part of the theme is don't defect, don't quit, don't turn back. This is one of the verses that suggests that. Uh, don't pick up a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from God. Hold your conviction firmly to the end. Uh, don't give up. Encourage each other. That's part of the reason we have a church. It's part of the reason we have a church family. And so we can encourage each other. We can do things together. And when somebody's struggling with a sin, others should be encouraging them so that their hearts don't get hardened by that sin. And that's the purpose of having a church body the way we do. Chapter 4 says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest, and again, we're talking, 
the Hebrew writer sharing how the old high priest under the Old Testament law, every year he had to go into the Holy of Holies place and do the sacrifice to push the sins down one more year. And he's talking about Jesus comes, he dies once for all. There's no more sacrifice after him. He says, so therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. Again, another challenge. Hold on. Don't quit. Don't turn away. Hold firmly to this. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet without sin. Yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to us in our time of need. Jesus was human. He went through the same trials and issues you and I go through. And because of that, he empathizes with us. He knows what we've gone through. He knows what we're dealing with. And because of that, the writer says, we can go to God's throne in prayer with confidence and boldness. Don't ever be afraid to pray. Don't ever think my issue's too minor, my issue's too bad, my issue's whatever. Always know you can always approach God's throne with great and confidence so that he can help us in our time of need. Okay? A lot of people today struggle with what do we do with the Old Testament? Do we still have to follow the rules of the Old Testament? If you ever study in a Bible study with someone who doesn't believe in the Bible, they'll throw up. Letter, Leviticus letters. Well, how come you're eating shrimp? Bible says you can't eat that. Yeah, well, how come you can't do this? How come we're not stoning people to death? Here's why. Chapter 8, verse 13. By calling this covenant new, in other words, the one God created through Jesus Christ, he made the first one obsolete. The first one is the old law. That's the comparison the Hebrew writer is doing. New Testament versus Old Testament. Christ's way of living, Old Testament, Moses' law way of living. He made the first one obsolete, and what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. Some people suggest by soon disappear, meaning Jerusalem's about to be destroyed. There won't be a temple ever again in Jerusalem because it's going to be over. So you can't come do the Moses stuff by traveling to the temple in Jerusalem, doing the sacrifices in Jerusalem, having the high priest do all that stuff, because it ain't going to be there any longer. It's going to disappear. But the key to this one is, we've got a new one. We're not under the old one. We don't have to live according to the rules of the Old Testament. We live under God's rules now in the New Testament. Here's another passage that basically says uh, similar kinds of things. First he said, and this is God talking, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. Why would the writer say that? That's exactly right. The attitude of the people. You just coming up and sacrificing some animal while your heart's living in sin or you don't give a hoot, you're not worshiping God, you're just going through the motions. Several Old Testament passages, God says, your sacrifices I'm not even paying any attention to. I'm not even giving you the time of day because your heart's not right. The attitude's wrong. You're checking the box off. You're checking the box off. You're going to church on Sunday morning and then living the rest of the week any way you want to. Same kind of idea. They were offered according to the law. In other words, you're supposed to do it. But if your heart's not right, you're in big trouble. Then he said, here I am. I've come to do your will. Jesus has come to do God's will. He sets aside the first. That was the law of Moses. And another reference to that. To establish the second. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. That's God's plan. We accept Jesus Christ. We become holy through his blood not through keeping a bunch of Old Testament laws. This is what Debbie's already given us, 11.1. 11.6 ties into it, says, and without faith, so once we get this faith, once we have it, once this is the definition of it, without that kind of faith, it's impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he is and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. That's the purpose of having this kind of faith. God says, if you haven't got it, you're never going to please me. Well, 11 is a faith chapter. It talks about yes, it several Old Testament people. Yes, that. and if you read through that chapter, you'll notice that kind of everyone who's listed there, everyone who's taught, whose faith is talked about, do something to please God. Their faith causes them to act, causes them to fulfill whatever it is God wants them to do. That last line, he rewards those who earnestly seek him. God doesn't reward those who haphazardly seek him. 
He doesn't reward those who seek him when they feel like it and don't when they don't want to. You've got to want God. You've got to make him priority in your life. You've got to earnestly seek him. But yeah, it's not a faith that says, well, I believe in Jesus, so I'm home free. All the people in Hebrews 11 do something, and that's why their faith is commended. Even Abraham had to do what he had to do, even though it was reckoned as righteousness because he believed, but then he did what God wanted him to do to earn that. You cannot simply say, I believe in God, and do nothing. Because James says, what? Faith without action is. No. That's true. Is dead. That, that was right. No, but that's what I'm thinking about. That's, that's where I was going. Okay, never mind. Uh, James says even the demons believe. Oh, they really shudder. Yeah. And shudder. So if just knowing who Jesus is and believing he is who he says he is, is enough, well, the demons are going to be saved. But we know they're not. The demons are not going to be saved. So just saying I have faith doesn't cut it. You have to show your faith. That's John's first verse. Faith without works is dead. If you're not doing what God says do, what James says, is you really don't have faith. If you really were sure, <coughs> Acts 11.1, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. If I'm absolutely certain what God says is true, then I know it says if I don't do what he wants me to do, I'm going to hell. And I believe that, so I'm going to do what he wants me to do, because he also says if you do what I tell you to do, you can go to heaven. So I'm going to trust and believe that, and that's going to motivate me to do what God wants me to do. That's the kind of faith God's looking for. Is that the belief that it's a, an action that you try hard to do? It's not one that you're always going to get right. That's correct. So because you screwed up one time, you're going to hell. That's how we were raised. That is how we were raised. There's no joy in that, though. There is no joy in that, because you're always afraid you're going to die at the, last, the wrong yeah. moment. You're going to commit a sin before you have a chance to say, oh, sorry, God, and you're going to die. You're going to hell, according to the group we grew up with. What kind of joy is that? Well, and that happened when we had our rollover accident. Yes. I remember it like it was yesterday of saying, God, I apologize for not being better. Yeah. Yeah. God doesn't take our salvation on a yo-yo stream. And when we do something bad, he drops it down and hanging around the floor, and then he pulls it back up when we say, I'm sorry. First John, which we'll get to next time, says we walk in the light as he is in the light. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. And what does Romans 1, 8, 1 say, John? Therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And we're more than conquerors. That's correct. So it isn't saved, not saved, saved, not saved. If you're, if you're in Christ and you're striving to earnestly seek him, you're saved. Period. Even when you're doing dumb, sinful, horrible things, you're still saved as long as your goal is, I want to be Christ-like. I want to do these things. Because we're always going to do dumb things. We're going to sin until the day we die. I think that's the difference between you're seeking God or playing the game. You're absolutely right. You're playing the game on Sunday mornings, yes. Monday through Saturday. I'm doing my own. You're, 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 you're in your own court. And, yeah. and that's why it's the heart that matters. God knows our hearts. He knows if you're playing he knows if you're trying to fool the other people at church. Uh, if you're earnestly seeking him, he rewards us. 13.1. This goes back to the one at the end of verse or chapter 1. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Goes back to the idea that angels are ministering spirits sent to minister to those of us who are going to inherit salvation. They show up in our life. I don't know how they do it. I don't know what they look like. I don't know how it always computes. But the Bible says it, so I believe it. The Hebrew writer said, angels move among us. Which means they look like people. Because we entertain them. How would you show hospitality to somebody who didn't look human? So these angels are able to adapt and look like us. And we can show hospitality to them. We can do good deeds to them. We can interact with them. Because some people have done that <coughs> without knowing it. Angels don't always declare who they are. Um, but we need to love people. We need to show hospitality to strangers because some of those strangers may very well be an angel that God has sent along the way to minister to you. Thirteen, fifteen, a few verses later. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. 
the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Notice this does not say, go to church on Sunday morning, praise God, and don't do it again for the rest of the week. We're to continually offer God a sacrifice of praise. Every day we should be praising God. You don't have to be in a church building to worship. You don't have to be in a church building to praise God. We need to be doing it every day, continually, letting God know how much we appreciate what he's done for us. And being kind and good to others because that makes God happy. Through Jesus, therefore, did I just read that one? Think of 17. Okay, let me pick up verse 17. Sorry, that's what happened. It says, Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy and not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. This authority is not the Romans 13 government authorities. These are church people. Those who are in your congregation who God has placed over you. For us, it would be your elders ministers, people who have authority over the congregation, this writer says, number one, have confidence in them, which means we got to know each other, you got to trust what they're doing, and we need to communicate well with each other, and submit to their authority. So if spiritually they're telling you, here's what we need to be doing, unless you can find some Bible verse to say, well, that's wrong, then you need to submit to that. Notice the idea, the reason you do is because God has placed us in a role of responsibility over people. Uh, our job is to watch your soul, is to help you be the best Christian you can be. And so God has placed us in that role. He says, do this so that their work will be a joy and not a burden. Got to confess, sometimes being a preacher or a church leader is not a joy. It's a burden. Some of the things you have to deal with, some of the people that you have to interact with, that takes some of the fun of it out of it. But the Hebrew writer says, respect these people honor them, obey them, uh, so that what they're doing is a joy to them. And there are, most of the time it is a joy. And most of the time I love doing what I'm doing where God has placed me. But the challenge is we need to respect our leaders and do what they're asking us to do when it comes to these spiritual things so that their, their joy is seen in what they're doing. What do you do if you have a leader that has taken power and thinks that they're God's greatest gift to everybody? Other verses talk about that. When Peter talks about if you're going to be a leader, if you're going to be an elder, you're not doing it for gain. You're not doing it for power. You're not doing it because you're the boss. Nothing in here says the leaders are the boss. You challenge them. You go to them because if we really are family, and we looked at that verse a couple of verses ago, loving brothers and sisters, those leaders are your brothers and sisters too. And we don't love them if we're allowing them to go down the wrong path of megalomaniac. You know, they're trying to think, well, I'm the preacher in this church, so it's my church. Everybody does what I say, or else, God help me if I ever get to be that way. But some preachers do get that way, and it's their church. Other Christians in that congregation need to love them enough to go talk to them and say, uh, you're screwing this up. Uh, we need to get this right. That's all you need to do. Well, hopefully the other leadership members <laughs> would approach first. If you have that. Well, yeah, yeah. Some congregations, all they've got is the preacher. Correct. He's the man. Yeah. Uh, other than our, like here in Central, we have a, a plurality of elders. Hopefully, if I was preaching somewhere or getting a big head or something, the elders would come to me and say, Bob, what are you doing? But even this, they're limited to that. Yeah. This is brothers and sisters need to love each other enough to say, what are you doing? Why are you not? Why, why are you acting so stupid? Uh, we owe that to the leaders just as well as we owe it to each other. Verse 20 of chapter 13, May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant, notice this covenant with Jesus is eternal. The covenant with Moses was for a set time frame, and it's done. It's over. That no longer applies but the God who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd and the sheep. May he equip you with everything good for doing his will. May he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. If God has got something for you to do, he'll give you the ability to do it. He will equip you to do his will. God will never ask you to do something you can't do without his will given it to you. He will make sure that you have the whatever it is, qualities, experience, health, 
training, money, whatever it is. Knowledge. Knowledge. And it may be that they may send someone else to you, like John and me working together. He sends someone else into the church or someone else to work with you. And that equips you to do what God wants you to do. It can work all kinds of different ways. Uh, but we need to understand, if God wants you to do a good work, he will give you the ability to do that good work. He'll make it possible for it to happen. And that's what pleases God. Okay? Questions about Hebrews? First Peter. Not as long as Hebrews. Five chapters, 105 verses, 1684 words. Uh, the date it's written from Babylon. First Peter 5.13 says, She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings, and so does Mark, my son. Where is Babylon at? That, that Peter is referring to. Some smarty last Monday night said, what's over there in Iraq? Well, the original Babylon was, Peter's not there, he's in Rome. Most of the time in the New Testament, if they reference Babylon, they're talking about Rome. Rome was the, the power that fought God's people, just like Babylon in the Old Testament was uh, the power that fought God's people. So most of the time, uh, when you see the word Babylon in one of the New Testament passages, it's talking about Rome. And so Peter, they suspect, was there. And he's saying she, who apparently is some Christian woman, who's at Babylon, who's likewise chosen, sent you greetings, so does Mark, my son. This is the same Mark who wrote the gospel. It's a Mark who traveled with Peter, uh, obviously a close friend to him, calls him his son, as Paul does several times with people. Does anyone really think, when it says Babylon, that they're talking about Old Testament Babylon? Nobody who's a Bible scholar does. Okay, that's what yeah. I'm, yeah, okay. I mean, because it was locked out. I mean, yeah, there is no Babylon now. Yeah. yeah. Medo-Persians conquered them and they were done. There is no Babylon. By the time the New Testament comes, there is no nation of Babylon. There is no power of Babylon any longer. So most people suggest uh, it's a reference to Rome using a different word uh, so that the Roman government doesn't get all upset thinking you're talking about us. Most people suspect it was likely after the fire of AD 64. That was the fire in Rome. That Nero, some people suspect Nero started it so he could have a bunch of new buildings done. But he blames the Christians for setting that fire. If you know the Roman history, and persecution comes uh, pretty heavily after that. Peter died, according to tradition, in about 67 AD. So they estimate this probably written somewhere around 65 AD, shortly before he died. Again, some 30 years or so after the church starts. The recipients, Peter tells us who it is. It's to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. This is the longest greeting in the New Testament. He writes to all these people. Some people suspect these are probably Jewish people he's writing to because he uses that reference dispersion. And Rome, one of the emperors in Rome at one time, and we see this in the book of Acts, uh, sent all the Jews out of the city. And a lot of Christians were Jewish, and so a lot of them would have been kicked out as well because they were still being recognized as Jewish primarily. And so that may be who Peter is writing to because it's to Christians who have moved into these areas, and that's where they would have been pushed to coming out of the city of Rome. So he's writing uh, to Christians who have been out. Again, it's the broadest specific addressees in the New Testament. Five different places he's writing to. Obviously, this is the letter they expect to circulate, uh, not just to go to one place and stay there. Was that dispersion before the fire? I don't know. I don't remember. I'd have to check that date. But Aquila and Priscilla were two of those people that got pushed out and came back. The emperor that comes along after, it wasn't Nero that did it, so probably was before. Which, which would make sense. Yeah. yeah. The date that they're written. Yeah. But the emperor after, whoever did that, lets all the Jews come back. So they come back, and that creates a real turmoil in the Roman church. Because you got all these Gentiles who were ruling the church after all the Jews got kicked out. Now the Jews come back and they're seeing the Gentiles doing it the way they're doing it, and that's a problem there. So again, probably 
Predominantly, Peter is writing to Jewish people as opposed to Gentile people. He has the same message as the Hebrew writer does. Stand firm and don't quit. He writes in chapter 5, verse 12, I've written briefly to you. He could say that because he's only five chapters in the hmm. most of the Hebrew writer who says I've written briefly in 13 chapters, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. Peter's telling these people, don't give up. Don't quit. Don't turn aside. Hang on to this. Don't go away. And it's going to be in the face of suffering. In the few verses before, he says, resist him. Stand in your faith knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. The same kinds of suffering. Whoever he's writing to, they're being persecuted. They're facing some tough times. He says, the same kind of suffering is being experienced by others throughout the world. Uh, so, in face of suffering, don't give up. Stand firm. Don't let whatever is going on around you drive you away from standing right with God. Simple outline, and you've got this in your handout. Puts persecution in perspective. Talks about, you know, what's the big deal? We need to be holy people because we're God's people. We need to submit to authority. We need to suffer with a good conscience. In other words, some people suffer and all they do is gripe and complain and whine and get angry and irritated. Peter says, you know, if you're going to suffer as a Christian, you can't do that. You can't seek vengeance. You can't start hating people doing it. You've still got to have a Christ-like mind, even in the middle of it. And so don't be shaken by your suffering. God's going to take you home, ultimately, and we need to be humble people. Anybody got any verses out of 1 Peter? 4.14. They read it to us. <coughs> said, if you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal or meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. I don't like that verse. I didn't like it. <laughs> you know, most of us, when we when people start wanting to take your rights away, what do we do? Get angry. We get angry, our back bows up. I got my right. You can't do that to me. That is not what this verse says. This says, glory, be glorified God because you're suffering. Be happy about it. Almost like the James, count it all joy when you have all these trials and suffering, uh, when when you're insulted, because God's glory rests on you. When you're being persecuted because you believe in Jesus Christ, you let God be seen in you. Don't get angry. Uh, don't pull out your guns and start shooting people. Notice you're being suffering and being insulted as a Christian. This does not say anything about if you're a law enforcement officer, you can't go arrest crooks. Doesn't say you've got to let people break into your house just so they can steal all their stuff and you sit back on your couch saying, take what you want. That is not what this verse says. This verse says if you suffer as a Christian, you need to rejoice. Because Jesus suffered, we're going to suffer. It's no shame to suffer being a Christian. Instead, praise God for the privilege of being called by his name. So when we watch this world, this country we're in, get worse and worse and worse and worse, and the Bible being taken out of places and all kinds of horrible things going on that we think, wait a minute, they're taking all of our rights away. We need to be reminded of this verse that says, hey, when you're being insulted and mistreated as a Christian, be joyful about it. Be happy about it. God is being seen in you. Don't get angry. Don't fight back. Act like Jesus did. Any others? Five eight B of it on your paper. So. Okay. Well, here we'll get to that. Well, here's one thirteen. <coughs> Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at His coming. There's the hope we have. The hope that when Jesus comes back, we get to live with Him as obedient children. Do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as He who is called holy is holy. So be holy in all you do, for it is written, Be holy because I am holy. We need to be like God. We need to try to be like Him. We need to be holy people, meaning we're living a kind of life that reflects God's glory. Not doing our own stuff, not doing things we did when we were ignorant of God. We need to be obedient children. We need to do what God wants us to do because God's holy. 
But set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus is revealed in his coming. That's the hope we've got. Jesus is coming back to take us to heaven. That's that faith. I believe that's true. It is an assurance that that's going to happen. It isn't a dream. Boy, I hope Jesus comes back someday. I hope he's coming back. No, it's I know he's coming back. And when he does, he's taking me with him. He himself, meaning Jesus, bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness by his wounds you have been healed. Jesus paid the price for our sins. We don't have to pay the price. We've talked in some way, some about Catholics who believe you have to go to purgatory. You go to purgatory for a while to, to pay for the sins that you committed. Why would I do that? Jesus has already paid for all the sins I will have committed. There is no such thing as purgatory. You're not punished as a Christian after you die to burn off all the sins you didn't get rid of while you were alive. You die with sins, you're in big trouble. Jesus paid the price. There is no such thing as purgatory. It's not in the Bible. It's a made-up belief, made up primarily so the Catholic Church can make a bunch of money because they sold passes for your loved ones so that when they were in purgatory, you could pay the church a bunch of money and they would say a special prayer and get your family out of purgatory faster. That's all it was. I don't know that it still is, but that's all it was. There is no such thing. Jesus Christ, through his righteousness, makes us righteous. 315, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. What do it mean to revere something? Honor it. Honor it. Recognize that's who it is. Worship him. He's Lord in your hearts. That's what it needs to be. Always be prepared to give an answer to any everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. We need to be able to explain to people, why on earth do we believe in Jesus Christ? Why do we believe the Bible is the Word of God? We need to be prepared to give an answer. And not just because. <laughs> that is not an answer. Not, well, that's the faith my mom and dad had. Or, I like the people at Central Christian Church. That doesn't cut it. We need to be able to give an answer for the reason for the hope that we have. We're going to start a study sermon series in February on apologetics, which is basically, let's explain why we believe. Apologetics in that word means to be able to give a defense, to defend what you believe. We're going to do a, we haven't figured out how many lessons there will be yet, but we're going to do a study on why do we believe? What are we supposed to know? How are we supposed to be able to share it with others? Because this says be ready to give an answer to people. We need to be able to defend what we believe, but with gentleness and respect. Can't get haughty. Can't be that preacher guy who's all bossy. But with gentleness and respect, because we love people. God loves them. God wants them saved. We need to treat them that way, not beat them over the head with the Bible. And I think if you're out there sharing the gospel, you're going to be questioned. You will be, that's right. If you're doing nothing, you'll never be questioned, which, of course, is not right either, because we're supposed to be sharing the Word of God with people. Chapter 3, verse 21, he talks about Noah and the flood and how by being in that ark, he was saved. He goes on to say, and this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but a pledge of a clean conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angel authorities and powers and submission to him. Christians around the world argue about, do I need to get baptized? What's the point of being baptized? Am I saved before I'm baptized or at baptism or what's going on? Just do it because God says do it. You know, just do what Jesus says. Stop arguing about all the things we argue about. Peter says, and it's a strange way to word it, baptism now saves you. Not because we get dunked in the water, but because it's the answer of a clear conscience toward God. Going back to the, the mindset, the, what am I thinking? What am I doing? I want to please God. I want to do what God wants me to do, so I'm going to get baptized. Paul says in chapter 6 of Romans, it recognizes, it symbolizes the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. We die to sin, we get our old body gets buried, our old sinful nature, and we come up out of that water a new creature. That's what Paul says baptism symbolizes. That's what Peter says, that it's a pledge of a good conscience. By being baptized, I'm saying to God and the people around me, I'm going to do my best to live the way God wants me to live. And we in the churches need to stop arguing about why are we doing it, what does it do, how does it work, all that kind of stuff. Just do it because God says do it. And then we don't have to argue about 
Well, when am I saved? Who gives a hoot? If you accept Jesus and you get baptized, you're saved. If you want to believe you were saved before you got baptized, you can believe that. Now, what Peter says, and Jesus says, he repent and be everyone who believes and is baptized will be saved. People read that verse and say, well, it doesn't say you won't be saved if you're not baptized. I mean, how dumb can people be? If I say to you, go out of this building and turn left and you'll get to my car, and you walk out the building and keep going straight, and people, well, he didn't, he didn't say I couldn't get his car if I didn't turn left. I mean, that's the way they read that verse. That's the argument they made. It doesn't say you're not saved if you're not baptized. Do you, like, leave your brains laying on the table sometimes? Think English. And there's a conjunction word that says that's what you're supposed to do. And again, don't argue about when you're saved or how does it do it. Just do what God wants you to do. And we wouldn't have all these stupid arguments that Christians have. Here's one we all need to be aware of. This year is John. Be alert and of sober mind. Maybe he's already said that several times. Peter is saying, get your mind centered on things that are right. Be sensible. Think soberly, not meaning don't get drunk, but reasonably, logically, put your mind where it belongs. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He did it to Jesus. He's doing it to us. He's tempting us. Jesus was tempted like we were, yet without sin. Say he's doing the same thing to us. He's tempting us. He wants us to sin. He wants to devour us. He wants to drive us away from God. We talked Monday night, I think it was, or it might have been Tuesday afternoon. The only thing Satan can do to hurt God is to take us with him. That's the only thing that's going to break God's heart, I think, is that so many people are following Satan instead of following him. Satan cannot steal our salvation from us. We can let it go. We can give it up because we just quit. We don't stand firm like all these guys are talking about. But God's powerful. If we go with Jesus Christ and stick with him, we're going to be saved. Satan can't grab us out of God's hands. But he's going around. He's trying to cause trouble. He's trying to bother your faith enough so you don't believe, so you don't stand firm, so that you do shrink back like the Hebrew writer says not to do. Um, he's out there. We need to be aware that he's out there. He's always looking to cause trouble. That's the end of Peter. Questions on Peter? All right, let me change my slides. And we'll go to the next handout that you've got there. Maybe you can think. I think we need more. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. She will be in just a minute. You see Mary Mel and Evelyn? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you have another copy for the new? Another copy of what? Hang up. Second hand. Yes. You need another one? I don't have one. Oh, I didn't. Oh, that's right. You came in late. I do. But I do. Yes, I definitely do have a good answer. <laughs> We're going to First Peter. Now we look at Second Peter. Second Peter is not quite as long. It's three chapters, sixty-one verses, thousand ninety-nine Greek words. The early church had a real problem trying to figure out who wrote it. Um, it was disputed, not because of what it says. Nothing wrong with the letter itself, but because of the glut and pseudepigraphal works. What does that big word mean? What is that? What does that word mean? John knows what that word means. Remember? Pseudepigraphal? Is it like personal? No, that was the other one. Never mind. So people were writing letters and claiming oh. to be Peter. Yes. So yeah. they would write a letter and say, I'm Paul, and I'm writing this letter to you. I'm Peter, and I'm writing this letter to you. And by the end of the first century, there were a lot of people doing that. I'm Jude, and I'm writing another letter. I'm Samuel, and here's a new Old Testament letter. And so there were a lot of them. There's a glut of them. There's a bunch of them. And so there was a struggle in the early church to figure out, was this really Peter? 
Or is this one of these fake things? That's like the Gospel of Thomas. Right? Like the Gospel of, well, no, because Thomas claimed, well, in a sense it would be, yes. Okay. They're claiming to be the Apostle of Thomas. Yes. Yes, okay. in a sense, yes. The letter says it's Peter. He's a servant and apostle of Christ Jesus. So ultimately the church decided Peter is the guy that wrote it. Uh, after I just studied it, reviewed it, passing it around, whatever, they finally decided it was Peter, but there was some question early on whether he really wrote that or not. Likely written from Rome, just like the other one, probably right soon before he's killed himself, before he's martyred. Peter says this in 2 Peter chapter 1, I think it's right as long as I am in this body, and you read that thinking, I may not be there very long, <laughs> I'm about to go, uh, to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon. So he's saying, yeah, I, I realize I'm about to die. Uh, it's almost like Paul's letter of 2 Timothy. Did you just say that before he killed himself? If I did, it's wrong, before he was killed, before okay. he was martyred, before he was executed. If I said that, I said it wrong. He says, so since I know that the putting off my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me, that's an interesting line. It says, in essence, Christ has told me I'm about to die. I'm about to go join him. My physical life is about over. And I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at all, at any time, to recall these things. Peter is saying, you know, I'm about to die. You've been told a lot of stuff, and so I'm going to write this letter to help you be reminded of some of these things you need to know. So you can recall these things. These people don't have photographic memories. You know, they've heard from Peter, they've heard from Paul, they've heard from Titus or Timothy and all kinds of people. How do they remember all that stuff? These letters are being written to them so that they can be reminded of these things. And this letter says, I'm doing this so that you can recall these things after I'm gone because I'm not going to be here much longer. That's how important they felt it was to them. Yeah, that's how important Peter thought it was. Yeah, I mean, Or even Paul and the rest of them. That's right. I mean, you know, not just to talk to them about it, but to... Write it down so it would be yeah. preserved. Because uh, the, the apostles are dying off. Yeah. Mean, they're being martyred. They're being killed off. By the time John dies in the late first century, they're all gone. And so how are you going to remember all this stuff? They've written it down for us. That's why it's here. So generally the idea of the date's given about 67 A.D., uh, soon before he dies. The recipient is stated in chapter 1, verse 1, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. In other words, he's just writing to Christians in general, not to some specific person, not to some specific church, but he's writing to Christians in general who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours. Notice when you read that line, Peter's not anybody special. His faith is equal to mine. My faith in Jesus Christ can be just as equal as Peter's faith in Jesus Christ is. He's not elevated to the Pope. You know, the Catholics believe he's the first Pope. Nothing in the Bible suggests that. And he says, you people who have faith, it's equal to mine. I'm no better than you are. You've got a faith just like I do. So likely sent to the same group as First Peter, but again, he doesn't really say. It's written to faithful Christians trying to just encourage them purpose, he tells us there in verses 12 through 15 of chapter 1, therefore I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have, I think it right, and again, we might be repeating that other verse, as long as I'm in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me, I'll make every effort so that you, at my departure, you may be able to at any time recall these things. That's the reason he says, here's why I'm writing this, so that you'll know that. It's always nice to let them have them tell us, why do you write this letter anyway? This is why. I can be reminded. Simple outlines, a short little book. Affirm your calling, Peter, where are false teachers? Isn't it amazing how many false teachers are mentioned in all of these letters in the New Testament? They're everywhere. They're still here, but they're everywhere. But we can have a confidence because Christ is coming. Verses, y'all got any? Here's one then in verse 10. Let me see. Did I write down what chapter that was? Chapter 1. Thank you. In my notes, I didn't put it on the slide. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. In other words, don't be a Christian half-heartedly. 
don't be a Christian by just trying to skate along. Make every effort. For if you do these things, you'll never stumble. Christians who stumble are usually those who are trying to play both sides against the middle. They haven't got their faith strong enough. They're trying to think, I can do my own thing half the time and God's thing half the time. Peter says, you know, if you'll make every effort to make your calling sure, you'll not stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's what we want, isn't it? We all want to go to heaven, spend eternity with God. Peter says, then work on it. Don't give up. Don't stumble. That's similar to the passage in Matthew that says you can't serve two masters. That's absolutely correct. You've got to make up your mind. Whose side are you on? God doesn't want us to be wishy-washy. Chapter 2, verse 4. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment, and I skipped a few verses, it says, and if this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to hold the unrighteousness for a punishment on the day of judgment. This is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desire of the flesh and despise authority. Chapter 2, Peter's listing a bunch of people who God punished. Sodom and Gomorrah, all these other people. And he says, God didn't even spare the angels. If that's true, don't you know he can punish the unrighteous? There are a lot of people today preaching, everybody's going to heaven. And there's some ch- big churches that are teaching, nobody's going to heaven. Well, God loves everybody. He's love. Everybody's going to go, even if you don't do anything right, even if you don't accept Jesus, uh, everybody's going to heaven. This verse says that's a lie. This verse says God knows how to handle those people who are unrighteous. And he's got them. He's going to hold them for punishment on the day of judgment. So we need to be assured there is a dividing line, those who are on God's side and those who aren't. And if you're not, you're not getting all these rewards. All these rewards God's offering are for people who belong to him, people who are in his family, people who have accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. But because that's true, he knows how to rescue us from trials. Remember, Peter's still talking about these persecutions that are coming. You're going to be persecuted. There's going to be tough times. God knows how to set rescue us from that. And it may be by dying, right? It may be he rescues us by letting us die and we go to heaven, we're rescued, right? We're no longer being punished. No longer have any sorrows or consequences. Chapter 3, verse 9, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. You know, the early church was expecting Jesus to come back momentarily. They wondered where he was. And some of Paul's letters make it pretty clear. Some people thought they'd already missed it. You know, we looked at that in First and Second Thessalonians, if you remember. And they thought Jesus had come and we missed the boat. Uh, God's promise is true. He's got his own time frame. Whatever he says is going to happen, it may not be on the time we want it to happen. But he goes on to say he's patient with you. He doesn't want anybody to perish. A lot of Christians teach what's called Calvinism which says God, before time began, chose who was going to be saved. And Cheryl, if he picked you, there's nothing you could do not to be. And John, if he didn't pick you, there's nothing you could do to be. This verse says, that's a lie. Because this verse says, God doesn't want anybody to perish. God wants everybody to come to repentance. If God had already chosen in the beginning of time who's going to be saved and who isn't, this wouldn't be true. Because God wouldn't want anyone to perish. He's already decided half the world or ten nine-tenths of the world or whatever it's going to be is going to perish if you believe in Calvinism. So this verse says Calvinism is not true. God wants everybody to be saved. We know that's not going to happen. Questions about 2 Peter? I do love this little book. One little chapter. 25 little verses, 461 Greek words. If you've never read Jude, I encourage you to go read the book of Jude. It's got some really neat stuff in it that we're not going to spend a whole lot of time looking at in this survey class, but it's got some pretty neat stuff. The author claims to be Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. Remember when we looked at the book of James? We looked at what James is this? Is this the apostle James? Is it the brother of James? Is it James the son of Alphia? Who is this James? We concluded it was Jesus' half-brother, James. And so that's what we presume this is for Jude as well. The early church accepted the fact that this is Jude, Jesus' half-brother. If you remember a verse, and we looked at this in the James study, Matthew 15, 30, or 55, Is this not the carpenter's son? Talking about Jesus. Is not his mother called Mary? 
are not his brothers, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas. Judas, another name for Jew. Judas the Judas here. And so these people in the Matthew account, Jesus has some siblings. Contrary to the Roman Catholic Church that teaches that Mary was a virgin her whole life and never had any kids, uh, these people were pretty sure these are Mary's kids. Uh, they're half-brothers of Jesus. Of course, to them, not knowing the story, they were the full brothers of Jesus. But we, you and I know that they were half-brothers of Jesus. But most of the early church believed it was Jude, Jesus' half-brother, who wrote this book. The date, Jude quotes 2 Peter. And so presumably written after that, June verse, June 17 and 18 says, But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, and they said in the last days there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. Peter wrote that. That's part of the apostle Jude is talking about. Don't you know the apostles said this? And so he's quoting Second Peter. There's no mention of the destruction of Jerusalem. Again, we've looked at that in some of the other Gospels. John doesn't mention that either, but we're all pretty sure he wrote his well after 70 AD. But most of the scholars look at that absence and think, well, probably written before 70. So probably around 68, it was written right after Peter wrote his second one. Some on the flip side say, no, nah, it's probably closer to 75 AD, even though he doesn't mention the destruction of Jerusalem. But again, somewhere in that time frame, 30, 35 years after Jesus, but a few years after Second Peter. The recipient, Jude sort of says, to those who are called, be loving in God, the Father, and kept from Jesus. Notice he's writing to Christian people, writing to you and to me. Purpose, he tells us what it was. He says, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, in other words, that's what he wanted to write. He wanted to write something positive, something good. He says, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago was designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Jude says, I wanted to send you some good news. I want to tell you about our common salvation, how wonderful it is to be a Christian, how we're all going to go to heaven, blah, 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 blah. He says, but instead, I found it necessary uh, to warn you about the error that's cropping in amongst you, uh, that you need to be standing firm for the faith. That was the same message we got from the last few writers that we've looked at. Stand firm. Don't give up. Be aware that there's false teachers out there. Uh, nothing's changed. They're still out there. Short little outline. Again, it's a short little book. Protect sound doctrine. Trust the truth. God punishes false teachers, and we need to be vigilant. There's people that's going to lie to you, misrepresent what the truth is, we need to be vigilant and know what the truth is so we can stand against that. Any verses out of Jude, anybody? Well, I've got a couple. What chapter do you think they come out of? Uh, first. Ah, <laughs> the first one. Verse 3. Dear friends, oh, again, we've already touched this. I like this verse, though. Although I am eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. We need to contend for the faith. What does that word mean, contend? Fight for it. Be bold. Don't be afraid. We need to contend for the faith. Make your calling and election sure, he says, uh, so that you're not having to worry about it. Verse 8, in the very same way, on the strength of your dreams, he's talking about people who are teaching error, people who are bringing false doctrine in. It says, in the very same way, on the strength of their dreams, these ungodly people pollute their own bodies, reject authority, and heap abuse on celestial beings. But even the angel, Archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not himself dare to condemn him for slander, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Jude's got some really neat stuff in it. He's getting the story from somewhere that when Moses died, remember God buried Moses. He didn't get to go into the promised land. Apparently the devil wanted his body for some reason. He wanted something to do. Moses was a powerful leader of God. Who knows what Satan wanted to do with him. But he's arguing with Michael the archangel about who gets Moses' body. But the point of the passage is even Michael then said he didn't rebuke Satan. He says, the Lord rebuked you. Apparently there are some people in Jude's day who are bad-mouthing Satan, bad-mouthing angels, bad-mouthing uh, spiritual things. 
I may be saying, you know, Satan can't do anything to us. Satan's a wimp. Satan doesn't have any power. And Mike and Judy saying, you need to stop doing that. The devil's pretty powerful. Uh, and even when the archangel was arguing with him, he didn't rebuke him personally. He said, the Lord rebuke you. Uh, some really neat stuff in Jude that we don't get anywhere else. Verse 22 23 says, Be merciful to those who doubt. How many of you in here have doubted? You ever doubted? Wondered? We need to be merciful to those. There will always be people who doubt. And sometimes we will doubt. Things will just hit us wrong and we'll think, you know, is this really right? Jude says, Be merciful to those people. Recognize they're just like you. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. In other words, we need to be nice to people. We need to love people enough to try to do good to them. Even if they're doing things that are wrong, we need to snatch them from the fire. We need to correct them. We need to help them see the truth, even while we hate what they're doing. We do not have to approve of what they're doing. We don't have to like their lifestyle. But we do need to show them mercy, trying to save them, trying to get them out of that. Because if you don't, they're going to hell. That's what that means, snatch them from the fire. They're going to go to hell if you, if you don't fix them. So we need to help these people. We need to work with them. We need to save those people by getting them back on the truth, back on the path, getting their mindset back on God instead of doing the things they're not supposed to be doing. That finishes Jude. Questions about Jude? He said, that's some neat stuff in Jude. He talks about the book of Enoch which is an interesting book. If you ever want to go online and read it, it's online. It's got some really weird stuff in it. The alien believers uh, believe the book of Enoch uh, supports the idea that there are aliens living amongst us. I don't believe that, uh, but it's an interesting read. Next is 1 John. We're, not, we're going to stop right there because this is as far as we've got Monday. Um, yeah, we're getting close to being the end anyway. 1 John's a good book. It's got a lot of stuff in it. We will not meet again until January. Our next class will be January 3rd for the Monday night class and then the 6th uh, back for the Thursday afternoon class. We will not be meeting here any longer. We will be meeting after the first of the year back at the church building in the fellowship hall. John's got us a TV and a stand and we'll be set up just like this in a way uh, and instead of having to come here, we'll be at the church building, uh, have our classes there beginning in January. Questions? Thoughts? Anybody? All right, let's close. God, thank you again for today, for the discussion that we had, for the Bible that we've got that we can read and learn from. And God, we just pray that you help us uh, strengthen our faith. And help us to be bold enough to speak up when we need to, with gentleness and love and yet still follow with the truth so that we can help others come to know you as well. Thank you for caring for us. Be with Deb. Help her to get you feeling better. And again, be with Evelyn and God help her as well to, to overcome whatever is ailing her at the moment. Uh, we give you the praise. Be with Paul and Emily. Uh, they're on their way down to Florida even today, I guess. Uh, so I pray for their safety and that you watch out for them while they're away from us. We give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Say hi to your sister. Jenny, don't worry. Oh, hi, Glenda. Send you love. Have you heard anything with uh, Patsy? She'll be heading home. Supposed to go home tomorrow, she's hoping. Oh, okay.